I'm Susan Brantley. Uh, I'm a professor of geosciences here at Penn State University and I study water, rocks, and soil. I've been working here for 34 years and what I like best about my job is working with students. Uh, the idea that young people come to this place in order to learn what I've been studying my whole life just makes it fun. And it's fun whether I'm in the classroom or in the laboratory, sitting at a computer or working in the field. Uh, teaching about what I know and what I've learned about through my career. Well, what I'm interested in is how the water that falls out of the sky gets into the rocks and how it changes the rocks and how the rocks change the chemistry of that water and in that whole process how the rock turns into soil. And so what we do is we work all over the world really, uh, but most recently we've been working a lot right here in Pennsylvania uh, and for example, we go up to the field uh, up on Tussie Mountain and look at field sites uh, very close even to Shaver's Creek Environmental Center uh, look, and poke holes all over looking at where the water is and how the soil changes around the landscape. So in some of our projects, we might have one person going out all alone, hiking through the woods, taking samples of soil or water. In other projects, we bring in uh, up to 40 or 50 people often from you know 10 or 15 different universities and get them all working together. For example, uh, a couple years ago we did a project where we uh, measured how earthquake waves move through soil in a really tiny landscape up near Shavers Creek Environmental Center and so we had about 50 people putting little seismometers all over the all over the landscape to, to detect the seismic waves that we were sending through the, through the watershed. And then to create the seismic waves, we had these little plates, little steel plates on the ground, and people took big sledgehammers and hit the plates, and that would create a little, little generated source of seismic waves that would move through, and we would collect the data all around the, all around the watershed. Or sometimes we actually took a gun and shot it into the, into the into the ground so that those waves would be generated. And so some of our projects are really small, some of our projects are really large in terms of getting a lot of people helping. Well, some of my days I go into my office, I work at my computer all day, and then we take the data that we've collected and try to analyze it and see what it means. Other days uh, I might actually be in the lab uh, working with a student, helping them uh, analyze water or soil chemistry. Sometimes we're in front of big instruments. Sometimes we'll take a piece of soil or a piece of rock, polish it up, put it into an instrument that then shoots an electron beam or an x-ray beam at it, and then we look at what bounces off, and from what bounces off we can learn things about the chemistry and the mineralogy of the sample. And then other days I'm actually out in the field walking around the landscape uh, thinking about it with my students. It's funny, but I got into this field because I love being outdoors. So probably my favorite things are all things out of doors. I like hiking, I like kayaking, I like canoeing, I like uh, skiing, uh, pretty much anything out of doors. I like just picnicking out of doors and being with other people. Probably I call myself uh, an aqueous geochemist, which is a fancy way of saying I'm interested in the chemistry of water. But in a way, that's, that's not everything because I'm really interested in how the water interacts with the rocks. Well. One of the things that we need uh, as human beings is to drink clean water. And so where the water is and how it's changed as it moves from you know, raining out of the sky, um, as it moves across the landscape to rivers and lakes and then ultimately to the ocean, determines what the chemistry of the water is and whether that water is healthy for us to drink. And so in a really big picture way, everything I do is related to the resource of water um, and, and how it stays clean um, and how it can help humans um, live. Now having said that, I'm also interested in another resource, namely soil and how soil develops, and that's where we grow our food. So those two things are really important to keep humans alive and healthy. Well, rocks uh, always have cracks and always have holes in them, so the water gets down into the rock, and then anywhere it interacts with the rock, it's going to change it chemically a very little bit. And then between the sort of chemical changes and then the physical changes, so for example, when water freezes inside of a rock, it can actually crack open the rock. 
that will slowly change the rock into small pieces of rock and eventually into small pieces of soil. And all those combination of physical and chemical processes slowly over geologic time uh, form soil. But the one thing that I'm missing there, the one ingredient in the recipe, is the biology. So uh, tree roots, gophers, uh, mice, uh, termites, beetles, any kind of insects, and then all the little tiny organisms known as bacteria, uh, they also interact with the water and rocks and very, very slowly over time, they biologically also change the, so the rock into soil as well. One of the, one of the types of, of rock or mineral that really is resistant to any kind of physical or chemical change is quartz. And this, this is a crystal of quartz. This crystal of quartz is not a natural crystal. This is a crystal that was grown in a laboratory. So one thing that you know scientists do is they try to reproduce what they find in nature. And quartz is a mineral that is very, very common, partly because it's very resistant, so it hangs around for a long time. But it also has a lot of chemical and physical properties that make it very, very useful. So I've always liked the outdoors. And when I discovered in college that I could spend my career um, understanding why water chemistry is the way it is, why Yellowstone looks the way it is, you know, why sulfur is precipitating around pools in Yellowstone. When I understood that I could spend a career understanding that kind of uh, set, of <clears throat> set of processes, it just seemed like the thing to study. Um, the top three things would be pay attention to what you're interested in and really try to study things that you're passionate about. Uh, try to learn uh, some math, even though sometimes the math doesn't look like it's that interesting. Follow it if you can. Then the third thing is just read, read, read. Read as much as you can. The more you read, the more you know. Okay, so why don't I show you what it's like in my lab, and uh, we can just walk down the hall. So the first thing you do when you come into a chemical lab is you put on your lab coat and your glasses. And that's because sometimes you're using acids or bases that can be uh, hurtful to your skin, not to mention your clothes. And you want the lab coat for your skin and clothes. You want the glasses because your eyes are your most important feature and you're trying to protect them. So we also want to wear gloves to protect our hands those on and I'm all ready and you can see uh, my lab here we have um, instrumentation on the, on the lab we have hoods and the hoods are where we put the even more uh, dangerous kinds of chemicals. Not that they are dangerous, but that if there was a spill, you want the fumes to go up inside the hood. So you keep that inside. And very often we have chemicals that have been made up over time and we save uh, for our experiments. Here we, here we have a, uh, an instrument that we use to measure the chemistry of the water. And you can see all the samples and the flasks that we use. And when this is running, we have one sample after another that is sucked up by a little pump and analyzed, and the data is collected by a computer. Are we good? OK, thank you. Sometimes what we have to do is, is take samples and separate them. So we have lots of flasks here that are empty at the moment but you can fill them uh, with either liquid or with uh, different kinds of particles and then pour samples through and it allows us to separate uh, the, the, uh, the water sample and then make a better analysis of whatever we're trying to analyze. So this is one of our labs where we have an instrument that we use to analyze water chemistry. And one of my grad students, Sam, you want to come in here for a second? This is Sam Shaheen. He's going to talk to you about some of his research. I'm Sam. I'm a PhD student here at Penn State. I study um, aqueous geochemistry, 
which is essentially the, the chemistry of natural water, is just how I sometimes describe it. Um, and my advisor is Dr. Sue Brantley. And so my research uh, specifically looks at how um, oil and gas wells, when they leak, um, can contaminate groundwater and the mechanisms through which that happens. It's important because it contaminates people's drinking water supplies, um, which has been a big issue here in the state. Um, they can also sometimes leak methane into groundwater, which is a really potent greenhouse gas, and we don't know a whole lot about what happens to that. So if it, if it reaches the atmosphere and contributes to climate change, or if it gets consumed and can make mobilize other contaminants in the groundwater that you don't want to drink. That's kind of the main focus of my research, is looking at methane and groundwater, and it's sources from both from what people are doing from um, drilling oil and gas wells when they leak, um, and also separating that out from its natural sources, and then what happens to the leaked methane as it's traveling through groundwater. So we, this is the ICP AES. Um, I use it a lot to measure the chemistry of the water samples that I take. So we can put, I can take a little small water sample um, and take a sample from that and run it through the instrument, and that'll tell me the concentrations of a lot of um, the chemical constituents of that water, so things that you might have heard of, like sodium or iron. Um, this instrument tells me the concentrations of that in the water sample. Essentially, how much of these different species there are in each water sample. So when we have really high concentration, sometimes for some species that's concerning because that might mean it's contaminated, um, versus a low concentration might mean it's a natural sample not really impacted, or it can be a high concentration due to natural processes. So measuring concentrations on this instrument is part of how we kind of separate out the processes that are happening in a island for contaminated samples versus uncontaminated samples. I think what interests me about the, the field is that it's kind of looking at how these natural processes happening in the world around us um, affect our groundwater, which in turn affects drinking water quality, so it's kind of the the earth processes and how they pertain also to essential needs. Everyone needs to drink clean drinking water, so understanding aqueous geochemistry is important for maintaining um, groundwater quality and make sure people keep drinking it for years to come. I think I, I wasn't always sure that science was my path. Um, I remember liking science all through grade school. Um, what really drew me in was I think I was interested in a lot of environmental issues from different perspectives, not just from the science perspective. Um, but I really liked that through science you can kind of get to the root causes of these issues and maybe try and help to solve them. Um, yeah, t day to day kind of depends. Sometimes I'm going to the field, sometimes I'm running samples in the lab. Um, Sometimes I'm on my computer and doing kind of database stuff with these big groundwater chemistry data sets that we have. So it's a broad range of things, kind of part of the exciting thing is that day to day varies a lot. It's not always the same. I really like the creativity of it. Um, I'm not the best artist, but I kind of appreciate that with science you have kind of a level of free range to what you want to look at. You can look at things that interest you. Um, and then apply that to societal needs. Um, so I think I really like being able to think through an issue and figure out how to approach it, um, and that creative aspect, the creative side of things that science brings. What's helped me is that like things that I was interested in reading about related to the environment kind of shaped my path in terms of what, what aspects of science I was interested in studying. Um, you know, I think one, one issue I remember is kind of uh, the question of mining. Um, and it, like I grew up in Minnesota and there was proposed uh, sulfide mineral mines by this protected canoe area wilderness um, and a big kind of controversy over whether those mines would contaminate the groundwater um, and the surface water and kind of ruin this pristine wilderness. And so that was kind of a complex issue where there are people that want the mines for the economy and people that want to protect the environment at all costs. And so really kind of a contentious issue that I remember reading about being interested in. Um, and now, now that I'm a scientist, I understand the kind of processes through which you might generate that contamination much better than I did then. But I think 
being interested in things like that kind of drove what I was interested in. Helped, I guess, refine my interest maybe and figure out what I was interested in. There's kind of dual, like it's not just the environment, it's also human health. And um, I like being able to kind of research, like I, I really like just think about the natural processes that take place on Earth. Um, not just the things that humans are doing, but also how that engages back to us, and so how we're maybe altering these processes, or how these processes affect the quality of the water that we drink. Um, I've always thought that's really interesting to think about. One instance is like maybe hard water, like if you live in State College, you've probably seen the white um, <laughs> crust that forms on like a water kettle, or if you leave your cup out too long. Um, we have really high um, concentrations of things like calcium um, in our groundwater here because we get our water from carbonate valleys, limestone valleys. Um, so then when we drink that water, it reflects kind of the, the groundwater flowing through all this these minerals that dissolve to put lots of calcium in our water and then that precipitates back out. Um, you know, there's also lots of farming around here and that's kind of an instance of something that can maybe alter our water quality. So a lot of the, the fertilizers that people put down can contaminate groundwater if you use too much of them, or surface water. So things like algal blooms sometimes come from too much fertilizer runoff. Um, and then in groundwater you can have a lot of nitrates, and sometimes those interact with the, the bugs, the microbacteria that live in groundwater, um, the microorganisms that live in groundwater, to change water chemistry even beyond um, what humans are doing. I would say follow your interests, um, if something excites you, you should look into it and engage with something, um, try and learn as much about it as you can. I think that'll help you figure out what you're interested in. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin and I'm going to be showing you how to do this week's science activity. So first off, thank you so much to Dr. Sue Brantley and Sam for showing us all of the cool science they do every day at the Critical Zone Observatory. So if you've ever been out by Shavers Creek Environmental Center or Whipple Dam, you've probably been right by their research area. And maybe you might have the same exact shale that they do research on in your own backyard. So we don't have enough time here to see how water affects bedrock because it takes a really, really long time. But we can study how water moves across a landscape in our very own backyards, just like the science at the Critical Zone Observatory do. Let's get started. Okay, so this is how we're going to be testing exactly how water shapes our own backyard. So you will need a couple materials for this activity. One is some sort of container that you're okay getting dirt and water in. I just used a foil baking container. Then you're gonna wanna go outside and you're gonna wanna get some dirt from your backyard. So I just went and found the closest dirt pile I could find and I made a little mountain over here. I also found some rocks in my backyard. There's some leaves in there, a lot of good stuff. So I'm also using some kinetic sand, some call it moon sand, just because I had it around and I thought it'd be cool to see the differences between the two. Plus I thought it'd be a little bit easier to maybe see the water in the sand. So if you have another material you want to test out, definitely feel free to. Feel free to build as many mountains as you want. And then for our kinetic side, I'm just using these tiny little rocks to simulate larger rocks that would be on a mountain. And as you can see, I named our dirt mountain Chewy and I named our sand mountain Perry. So those are the names of my two cats. Feel encouraged to name your mountains whatever you would like. And some other materials I have, I have a clean spray bottle filled with water. And I also have a cup full of water. So what we're going to be doing is seeing how different levels of water flow affect our two mountains. So I'm gonna be using our mist bottle to spray the mountain and see what happens. And then I'm gonna be dumping a little bit of water from our cup and seeing what happens. And then finally, I'm gonna dump the whole thing on the mountains and see what happens. So each time when I do this, I'm gonna be making an, a hypothesis of what's gonna happen. 
and a hypothesis is just a prediction or a possible explanation for a question that needs to be investigated. So I'm going to think about what I think is going to happen ahead of time. I'm going to write it down on our whiteboard back here, and then we're going to see if it happens. So if you want to pause this video and do all of the different steps and make your own hypotheses, that's totally cool. So the three phases are you're going to mist it, you're going to dump a little bit of water, and then you're going to dump a lot of water. But if you want to stick around and watch me first and then go try, that's totally fine too. So as you can see, I already made my first prediction about what I think is going to happen. So these little tiny water droplets up here are what I think is going to happen. So I don't really think the water is going to change our mountains too much with just a mist. Granted, I haven't tried this before, so I might be totally wrong. And that's the cool thing about being a scientist is that you can make a hypothesis and be totally wrong and it still works out. So I have the mist ready to go and I'm going to do Mount Chewy first and I'm going to spray at this top part right here. Okay, so it didn't, it moved a little bit at first and definitely the more I spray it, it seems to move. It's kind of turning into mud. All right, let's try Mount Perry next. I'm gonna spray kind of right in the middle of those two mountain peaks. Ooh, the sand doesn't move at all. But I do see that the sand isn't absorbing the water as much as the dirt is. It's kind of going through this little part right here. Interesting. So it did definitely change the landscape of the dirt a little bit, which I didn't expect, but that's okay. And it didn't really on the sand, but it is kind of pooling here. So I wonder if I left it for a while, if it would happen. So you can also try misting other places and make more hypotheses and see what happens. It's kind of fun to just spray the bottle, to be honest. Okay, so I'm going to make my next prediction, which is for pouring a little bit of water. I've made my predictions for pouring a little bit of water. And what I did was the solid black line shows where my mountain started. And this dashed line is what I think is going to happen when I pour the water. So I think it's going to go down and kind of change into a U shape. And then where the blue is, that's where I think the water is going to go. So I think it's kind of going to go in between these two rocks and go down. And then for the sand, since it didn't change that much when I misted it, I don't think this is gonna go down too much, but I do think it's gonna change a little bit. So I'm using my knowledge from our first experiment to determine our second. And then I think the water is gonna get stuck here a little bit because it kind of pooled here. So that's what that represents. Okay. So I'm gonna do Mount Chewy first with my water cup. Just pour a little bit. Interesting, okay. So it seems like a little bit of water went this way, but I was right that most of it went in between these two rocks. And it did definitely go down a little bit. Probably not as much as I was expecting, but that's okay. Now let's try with Mount Perry. I'm gonna pour it again right between those two peaks. Yeah, that sand isn't budging at all. It's very sturdy rock. So in the geology world, which one of these do you think would be more easily eroded? So erosion is when things are washed away. So I think it would be this one if it was a rock because of how easily it moves from the water. And this one's a lot more packed in because it's sand and I really packed it into this mountain shape. But that's just a guess. That's just a hypothesis. So now I'm gonna make my hypothesis for the third trial, our third experiment, which is a lot of water, which is not a very scientific measurement, but that's okay. Okay, so since I'm pouring a lot of water on both of these, I think that both of my hypotheses are going to be that the water is gonna go every which direction after I pour it. So before it was kind of sticking in its little channel here and here for Mount Perry, 
but I think this time it's going to go around the bigger rocks and the big, bigger marbles and just go everywhere. I think that Mount Chewy is going to change a lot. I think there's going to be a really deep river basin type phenomenon here. And also the top's going to get worn down a lot. And then with Mount Perry, I really don't think it's going to change too much because the sand is really packed in as we've learned from our first two experiments. So we shall see. I also ended up getting a pitcher of water because I decided the cup was not going to be enough for the amount of water I wanted to pour. So before I pour it, I want to ask, do you think that me pouring them, pouring the water in the same container with both mountains, do you think they affect each other or are they independent of one another? I'll let you think about that. Okay, so I'm going to pour Mount Chewy first. <laughs> I feel like that pour might have answered my question. So as we can see, Mount Chewy got pretty wiped out, to be honest. It's kind of hard to tell with the angle. But as you can see, about half of it's missing and has gone over <laughs> to Mount Perry's side, which is rather unfortunate. But I was pretty correct that it went every direction and that a lot of it would be worn down. So let's see if anything happened with Mount Perry. <laughs> so yeah, not a lot changed except more water rose so we can kind of see less of Mount Perry now. But it's definitely getting worn down. You can kind of see where this is a ridge now because I kind of pour it right here. And then this little, this little divot between our two peaks has certainly gotten less and less. Do you think this would have been a different result if I had them in two different containers? I don't know. I guess that's an experiment for another day. Well, thank you so much for learning about how landscape can change with water. And I hope you had fun learning more about the soil in your own backyard and how it might be affected by water. And maybe next time it rains, you can look outside and try to see if the rain does the same thing as your experiment. Perfect. Thank you so much.